I mm-hmm. think of myself as a primary source documentarian. And what I mean by that is that I try to collect raw footage of situations. Mm-hmm. Usually it's political activism is the thing that I've ended up focusing on the most over the last decade. And the idea is to capture raw documentary footage of those situations, including live streams. And the purpose of it, putting it out there, is having people be able to see exactly what happened. But um, the distinction between just objectively covering something Mm -hmm. like that and thinking of what my work is as primary source documentary is that the purpose of it is for it to take another step that is um, beyond what I'm controlling, which is licensing to other places. So, so you, documentary films. Yeah, themselves. you license to documentary filmmakers who use your footage in their projects You for cable news, right. uh, places like Fox, CNN. Um, can you explain um, you had an experience, you, you covered January 6th, and I want to mm-hmm. talk about what that was like from your position, and CNN used some of your January 6th footage. Um, can you use that example to kind of talk about how, like, you create a primary document, then a news source comes in, mm-hmm. and they're going to recontextualize it, or you know, and it could be decontextualize it, recontextualize it, miscontextualize it. But sure, <laughs> what was going on? Wh- what did you shoot at January six, and then how did CNN use it, and how do you feel about that? Right. So I have a variety of stuff. I mm. was at January six all day and kind of got a variety of angles. But one of the most kind of notable moments that I captured was. Uh, the entering of the Oath Keepers, uh, Mm -hmm. several members of that kind of militia group, into the East Door. (laughs) So an example of how my work is used is that, so CNN licensed that footage Mm -hmm. and they used it to illustrate an interview um, with a lawyer representing some of the Oath Keepers. So oftentimes, like, the idea of like, well, I have it in context. It's not necessarily a criticism of the people who are licensing it from me. Mm-hmm. I don't have any particular grievance with the way that they use that. But I do think that it's important that people who are watching the news and are actually interested in being educated about mm-hmm. it should be able to see what things look like right. in context. Um, so this is like, I mean, your primary source, it's like a hyperlink in a story where you, you somebody's quoting a court decision and they mm-hmm. have three or four lines. You can click on that and go... And see, is that a proper use of that quote? Right, exactly. And so I, I've had occasions where I've documented events and I can see that the way that the news covers them, whether they use my footage mm-hmm. or not, um, is sort of inaccurate or misleading. Mm-hmm. Um, and even when something is accurate, it's still removed and taken into a new format, right? right? It's a lawyer and a journalist discussing a legal case. And I filmed something pertinent to that case. Yeah. Um, for the audience who actually wants to see how it happened, you want to be able to have that availability of video. And news outlets don't, for the most part, actually make that public, right? If 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 CNN had been there filming that themselves, they would only use what they need to make that point. But it's not like they would say, here's our library of raw footage for you to check out if you want to learn more. Um, Is this, um, you know, you're part of a lineage now. I would date it back um, at least to the Rodney King beating. The video of that, which was taken by a regular guy, a citizen who was trying out a a video camera, Mm -hmm. and he happened to look across the way and, you know, he saw the LAPD beating the shit out of a guy who turned out Mm -hmm. to be Rodney King. Um, And that, you know, became a kind of touch, a flashpoint because it was kind of like a surveillance camera being turned on power on Mm. law enforcement in this case. Um, But since then, the ubiquity of cameras and the ability of different people in different contexts filming things, um, it really kind of changes things. This is also true of George Floyd, right? Mm. That absent the video of George Floyd, there probably is not the, um, you know, that moment uh, in 2020, even with COVID and everything. Um, how, how powerful is this shift, you know, that you're part of? Yeah. I mean, I think, so firstly, I do film the police a lot at these mm-hmm. political activism type events. I've tended to find that a variable in whether something turns into a Charlottesville like situation yeah. or what I see more often is, you know, opposing sides show up and police actually separate them mm-hmm. and then it doesn't enter the news right. uh, because it didn't turn into a fight. Yeah. Right. So I've documented police tactics. And mm-hmm. I think that that's really important for people to see when things go bad. Why did they go bad? When mm-hmm. things go right? Why did they go right? Um, as it relates to policing beyond activism, 
I actually gave a speech at a conservative conference in 2019 where I argued to a room full of people who really like cops, mm -hmm. um, basically that you should exercise your First Amendment right to film the police. Right. Um, and there was a question I got during the Q&A where uh, there was a person who expressed the concern, well, what happens if you basically film a police officer doing something that looks bad, but it's out of context, right? Mm -hmm. That you see a cop hitting somebody, but you don't know what happened right, right before it. And the solution I had to that is like, the problem is not that you filmed that moment. The problem is that you missed whatever came mm -hmm. first. Um, and so there's all kinds of arguments that people can yep. make about surveillance of the citizenry. Right. But I uh, strongly believe in surveilling the state yeah. <laughs> as citizens um, to the extent possible. And um, that can mean body cams, right? That, right? that kind of thing I do think of as a positive development. Mm -hmm. But my actual observation has been that Police departments often have the discretion to release whatever stuff mm -hmm. they kind of want. Sometimes it's forced out by court cases and mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but I have a friend who's a journalist who got uh, shot with a rubber bullet in D.C. And when they went to they said, I want the body cam footage of me getting shot with a rubber bullet. The uh, police said, sure, that'll cost thirty thousand mm. dollars. Um, not exaggerating. <laughs> I've seen mm. this email. The way they described it is, well, we would have to go through every single body cam and then we'd have to redact every single face that isn't yours yep. as we look for it. We estimate it'll take this number of man hours. Mm -hmm. It'll cost you $30,000 to get that. And so as much as we might want to rely on uh, the state self-reporting, right. uh, I do think it's really important that we have citizen journalists out there out there filming what's happening.